Good morning. This is Rich Sierra, president of the Florida Small Business Legal Center. This is episode number 59 of Business SOS. Thank you for listening to us this morning. Uh, we're very excited to continue our conversation with Jamie Diaz, president of Dynama Doc Training Center. And in this particular episode, we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit more and talk more about tips for doc training. Uh, so we're very excited about that. If you have a dog, you're a dog, you're a dog owner, this is going to be a very special episode for you. You're going to get some really special tips that you'll benefit from today. Jamie, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about, and, and perhaps before we go into the actual tips, is the uh, tell me a little bit more about Dynamo Dog Training Center and the services that you offer. So we offer a variety of services. We have group classes, private one-on-one -on -one training, either at the center or in the home. We have a uh, day training, which is like my baby. It's a school for dogs. So pretty much you can drop off your dog. Like they're going to school and you get a vid videos of what we do with your dog lessons that we do. So you can practice them at home. We have virtual training. So the virtual training, I have clients all over the country, Nigeria, Spain, everywhere, which is amazing for me. Uh, sometimes time is a challenge, but we figure it out. If I can see you, I can coach you. So sometimes it's actually better. Once you go into somebody's home, you're changing the whole dynamics of this, what's happening. But when I can see you in real time of what your dog is doing, I'm able to help you. Those started at COVID and we've kept them and we are booked with virtual sessions as well. And then we do everything from therapy dog training to service dog training. So uh, the service dog training too, lots of training, but we are pretty proud of the service dogs that, you know, come out of our school. How do you train a service dog? So the service dog you need, we have them pass a bunch of the AKC is the American Kennel Club. They have a bunch of tests called canine good citizen, different various ones. We have them pass really most of those. And then they need to perform three tasks for whatever the disability is. Uh, it doesn't, we don't care what the disability is. We don't need to know. We just need to know what the tasks are. And then we train those tasks. We have everything on video. And then once you've done that and you've graduated everything, we give you everything, the TSA letter, everything that you would need to fly with your dog, uh, for living with your dog, everything from that, that you would need to continue on with your service dog. How long usually that training takes? Well, uh, depends on the person, depends on the dog. Some people are, uh, really lazy dog owners. I am too. I, I bring my dog to school because I don't have time to train my own dog and that's okay. But then they're only getting the training when they're with us. Some people are really into it. They practice every single day. I have clients that are like, you know, five times a day, they're practicing with their dog. They get there a lot faster. So there's no like time. Sometimes you just have that amazing dog that has no problem behaviors. You, they don't jump, they don't pull on the leash. So we don't have to fix all of those issues. It really depends on the person, how much work they want to do. If they don't want to do the work, if you're like, I need the service dog and you're really busy, you know, doing your stuff, we can do it. It just might take a little bit longer. Okay. Something that we didn't mention in the last episode, describe your facilities and the type of facilities that you have for, for dog training. So we have, well, they're all different. So we have everything from a storefront. Uh, my place in Jupiter is a freestanding building on an acre. So that's very different. We have a huge field. Uh, Deerfield's in the warehouse and then Delray is in the storefront. They're all very different, but have the same kind of thing. The dogs have to be crate trained. So we have, uh, you know, safe crates for all the dogs. So they need a break during school. And then we have a huge uh, two to three training rooms at every facility. So we could do the one-on-one -on -one training. We can do the group training and uh, they're all pretty built the same way, wherever they are, whether it's a storefront or freestanding, we just need the space to train safely. And then the dogs do need to be crate trained to take a break during the day. Well, so how many, in, in any given, you know, you've been in business now for 15 years, mm -hmm. correct? Which is a big accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, and say in a yearly basis, how many dogs go through your school? So we have about 30 to 60 dogs at each facility daily. Uh, how many dogs? Probably thousands. I mean, we, we have a, a lot of dogs coming through. A lot of people are nervous about leaving their dogs, which I, I get. But once they see what we do, they, they love it. And we do 
offer also a free day for people to try it out. So if you get a puppy, you want to see what it's all about, come to us, take it to us, and you'll see what we do. Every dog that comes to us, you get video report cards of what we're doing. So it's great that I'm training your dog, but you need to know what to do. So I think that's what clients love the most is they get 10 videos every time their dog is there on how to train your dog. That is awesome. That is, um, that is, you know, great service. Um, what are the challenges? Say somebody adopts a rescue dog. What are the challenges that owner will be facing right from the back? So what I see the challenges are is uh, everybody loves their dogs, but they don't put a routine in right away. So I think crate training is mandatory for dogs to have that safe space and to be able to take a break when they need to. And I think when rescue dogs come in, they just feel so bad for them that there's no routine. They're allowed to do whatever they want. And then they wind up having all of these training issues because they did not put that routine in place right from the beginning. Uh, rescue dogs are amazing. So if you take a rescue dog, new start, new home, new rules. So if you start those rules right from the beginning, meaning, okay, he's not allowed in this room. I don't want him on the couch. He's going to take a break in the crate when we leave the house. So he doesn't chew through our walls. If you set those up from the beginning, your time with that rescue is going to be way more successful than just having a free for all. And I think people make that mistake right from the beginning. And then we're kind of fixing the problems afterwards. Just for our listeners, what is crate training? So crate training. So for puppies, it's really for me, the only way, best way that you can potty train your dog because they learn to hold their potty in there. It's like, think of it as a crib for a baby, right? So some people think it's mean. It's not mean. Dogs are den animals. They like that safe space. So it's, if you're leaving the house, your dog should really go into, you can get a nice like metal crate, hard plastic crate that they can stand up, lay down comfortably in it and close so that, you know, that nothing dangerous is going to happen, but it's also a forced break. So people that have puppies, their puppies get overtired, their puppies get bitey, their puppies need a nap. So that crate gives you two hours, three hours that you can have your dog rest peacefully in the crate. So I think it's an important training and management tool. If your dog has something wrong with them and they have to go to the vet, guess where they're going? In a crate. So when you don't crate train, now your dog is sick in the hospital and he's uncomfortable in a crate. So I think it's important in all aspects uh, you know, of life to have your dog crate trained. So what tips can you give dog owners in reference to the, uh, crate training? How do they get started? So great question. I would start by, if it's a puppy, it's pretty easy. You start with sleeping them, they adapt to it very quickly, but you could start by feeding them in it with it open. So what we don't want to do is them go in and we uh, slam the door there. That's not going to be very inviting for them. So you could start by one or two weeks of having the crate open with feeding them in it, throwing treats in it, toys, everything happy happens in the crate. After about two weeks, then you can start shutting it. Your puppy will cry. It's about three days. Your puppy is going to cry. Your dog is probably going to give you a little bit of a hard time, but it does stop. If you can hang in there for those three days, the dog will start understanding what's happening and they will be not crying anymore. I think as soon as dogs cry, owners take them out really quick. It's super important to like stick to your guns. As long as the dog is not uh, biting at the crate or doing something that's unsafe, stick to your guns. The dog will learn to love their crate, but you can start by feeding them in there. That's behavior management. Yes. Yes. I don't know how people do it without it to be, to be honest. Uh, it's just, you have a worker coming in, you have the pool guy coming in, your dog doesn't like the pool guy, put him away, put him in the crate. There's no reason your dog has to like the electrician, right? Put him away safely. And you don't want a, a accidental bite to happen. Dogs bite when they're scared. So take them out of that scary situation and utilize the crate. We're going to digress for a second. You mentioned bites. What are the conse potential consequences to a dog owner if the dog bites somebody else? So one offense, uh, they usually have to quarantine for 10 days. Uh, second offense, I think they're required to wear a muzzle and it depends who they bite because you can get a lawsuit very easily from if they bite the wrong person or non dog person. The third time they will euthanize if your dog has bit. So I always say 
even muzzle training for your dog when they're in that scary situation, it, it's a good thing. You know, don't have your dog a chance to bite the veterinarian, right? Let's muzzle train them safely, kind of like the crate you feed them in and you do different things. So there's all these little tips and tricks that you learn when you hire a professional dog trainer. I would never think to muzzle train my dog, but guess what? My dog had an ear infection, hated men. They only had male techs at the vet and he would have bitten the male tech, but he was muzzle trained. So I put it on and then there's no bite. So bites are pretty scary. You really want to be careful and you really want to make sure that you train your dogs early. So you don't have that happen. What is muscle training? So muzzle training, it's like a basket. It looks like a basket muzzle that you put on their muzzle. You don't want one that's just closed. So you hold it like a bowl and you put the food in there. And so then they're just putting their mouth in the muzzle. That takes about two weeks as well. Soon they're like racing to put their mouth in that muzzle and you've muzzle trained your dog. It's kind of like riding a bike. So if you do it as a puppy, you bring it out when they have an ear infection, when they're two years old, they're like, oh my gosh, I love that thing. I got all treats and peanut butter in there and they put their face right in. It's really good. There's actually a whole muzzle up program that, uh, because the muzzles get a bad rap. You think the dogs are aggressive. That's not the case. When dogs are hurt, they're going to bite. If you don't have your dog muzzle trained, you know what the vet's going to do. They're going to slap on their own muzzle. So it's better to, to do that as well, to muzzle train your dog. That, that's a very great tip. Um, one of the questions that are common, perhaps, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Yes, I love that question. I had uh, two poodle puppies that hired me. They were 12 years old. They did not even know how to sit. We taught them everything. I don't, I don't know why it took him so long, but it did. We taught him literally everything. So you can teach it old. It's never too late. It's never too late to teach your dog. It's never too late to fix bad habits. It might take a little bit longer because they've been practicing them longer, but every dog can learn the same as a puppy. A 10 year old dog can learn. And actually all adult dogs kind of absorb it quicker. A puppy has like puppy brain. They're not fully developed yet. Okay. An older dog is sometimes easier to train. Okay. That's awesome. Um, what other training tip you can provide to, uh, to our listeners today? Okay. So let's, you already hit on one. My number one, and this is especially for puppies is crate training your dog. So all puppies, all dogs, I think should be crate trained. That's number one. Uh, number two, I would say have mental stimulation for your dog, different things. Like there's puzzles. There's a thing called a snuffle mat, a licky mat. These are all things that the dog gets to use their nose. You want to provide not only physical stimulation, but you, they need that mental stimulation. It's kind of like us doing crossword puzzles for them. That's what they need. They need these things to do. And actually mental stimulation gets them more tired than, than physical stimulation. And I would also say to train your dog, do they love to train. So do something. You don't always have to spend thousands of dollars to hire a dog trainer and you can do group classes. You can do so many different options that, that you can do to train your dog. I think it's really important to not, don't wait till the problems are so big that now it's like a real issue. Like right away, simple training's pretty easy. It's, it's pretty easy once you know how to do it. So even the virtual sessions that we do are pretty affordable and I can teach you everything in 30 minutes, you know? So you really want to make sure that you're doing some kind of training with your dog as well. I think the, the consequences of not having proper training of the dog could be significant. And I had a neighbor move away a few, um, I think last year that he had a, a poodle and the poodle ended up biting somebody at a CVS, CVS, a pharmacy. And he told me I have this big lawsuit and I guess he had a lawyer, he got it resolved, but, the consequences to a dog owner that bites somebody else are significant. Very. And you will have to pay, pay that out of pocket. Yes. So I think just if you're investing in a dog, you must well invest in the training. You'll have, I think, a better experience, a much better relationship with the dog, I, I would imagine. Yes. And I would say uh, another tip so you don't get bit, don't pet strange dogs. They're not asking for you to pet them, right? So. <laughs> It's just like, uh, you know, I don't need to shake every single person's hand that I pass on the street. We have this thing that we think that other dogs want. They don't want a stranger to pet them. So I think it's a privilege to be able to pet a dog. And I think that the dog needs to ask for the petting. I would say that's like one of my, uh, on social media, I do this all the time. It's the five second rule. So you pet your dog or even a strange dog for five seconds, stop and see what they do. 90% of the time, the strange dog walks away. 
That is them telling you, I, I'm tolerating you touching me, but I really don't like it. So I think that's a really important tip to uh, don't touch strange dogs. Let them ask you if it's a puppy that runs up and, you know, wants to be pet. That's one thing. But even for your own dogs, practice that five second rule and see what your dog, your dog wants to do. I think dogs are so good at communicating. We are so bad at reading that communication. So I, I think that's what dog trainers also I try to help do is read your dog what they like. Them walking away is telling you, I don't want to be pet. Just simply walking away. They don't have to be growling or biting for them to get their point across, right? So it's reading those little subtle things, but try not to pet strange dogs. Yeah. You'll avoid a bite as well. Uh, I'm going to ask you a reverse question. Actually, it's for me and Sherry. We're going to visit some friends up soon in Colorado, and they have a giant poodle. It was a puppy at 140 pounds a few months ago. It's going to be very big <laughs> when we see him in a few weeks. So the dog is very uh, rambunctious, very happy. It tends to go and jump at you. What should we do? So I love this. I have, <laughs> I have this too. I would ask the owners for kibble or something. So actually, when I walk into a house, if you take food and throw it on the floor, you redirect the dog to do something else to get the food. They're building a positive association with you because you're throwing the food. And what happens is after they eat that food, the owner is usually able to get a sit or something from them after that. But when they're in that heightened mode, no learning is taking place. They're not going to listen. They're not going to sit. So food is your friend in training. You literally, you're not going to have to do this forever, but to avoid that jumping, ask the owners to leave a little bag of kibble outside and when you come in, throw it on the floor and you're going to be surprised. I just did a, a video with a golden retriever that was at my school jumping on my kids. I saw the video. You saw it? Yes. Jumping back, jumping back, jumping back, jumping back. All we did is got a licky mat, put the licky mat down. They came in. He, they could care less about the kids. They did not jump on them once. We actually couldn't even get the dog off the licky mat to say hi. So find an alternate behavior instead of the jumping and food will help you with that. Okay. No, we, we know that. Uh, you take notes. I usually tell if you if if you would just listen to, to the professionals sometimes, right? I'm like I tell people I promise you this problem will be fixed. Listen first, and then you can do things like training, go to your place, stay. But a lot of dogs are not ready for that, so do have them leave some kibble outside for so you. Just like redirection. Yes. Okay. Yes, there's management and there's training. Right in that moment, he's not going to sit. He's not going to do anything. So let's give him an alternate behavior so he doesn't practice jumping on you. So what do we do when you know we have friends' houses that have dogs that come to us and they want to sniff you? What what are they doing there? So they are gaining information. They don't want you to pet them. I think this is super important. We used to put out our hand. Right, that is a great way to get bit. Do not put your <laughs> hand out to sniff the dog. You're invading their space. So if a dog just comes up to sniff you. Just sit there. They just want to sniff you. I do a lot of training at a, uh, a shelter and every dog that comes in, every shelter dog that comes in, we let them off the leash and there's, you know, people around. The dog goes up to every single person and sniffs them. He doesn't want to be pet. So I have to tell people, don't, don't reach out and pet him. He's gaining information. That's how they gain information through their nose. How we look and we kind of like, you know, check everything out. When, when we see somebody walk, walk by, it's them too. They're gaining that information. They don't want to be pet. So just let them sniff. Don't put your hand out because that's another great way that you can avoid a bite. Thanks for the tip. I'll definitely keep that in mind. Yes. <laughs> protection. The uh, one thing that I, we talked about before is about the portion of patience and persistence during training. Yeah. You, I have a ton of patience. We all have patience. I have patience with other dogs, right? With our own dogs, we tend not to have as much patience. There's an emotional thing there. So I, I don't care if your dog barks at me for 10 minutes, I'm not giving him attention for that. You are going, all right, like enough, you know, you're, it's your own dog. It's emotion. So I think it's super important to be patient when you're teaching your dog. And usually it's the teacher. Once you know, oh, you know what, Rich, if you put your hand down a little bit lower, he's not going to jump up like that. So once you're kind of coached like that, you're able to have success because it is frustrating when you're trying to get your dog to stay and they just won't stay. Well, your dog doesn't know how to stay. That, that's why you're, you're not being successful. So I think it's super important to have that patient, take things slow. And if you see that you're not successful with training, reach out to a professional because we can help you in minutes instead of you struggling for years to try and, you know, 
train your dog, but patience is, is once you're not patient, it's like kids. Once you kind of lose it, mm -hmm. nobody's listening, right? That's it. Okay. So. so one thing you mentioned earlier, uh, that you're, you're basically, your training is reinforcement slash force free method. Can you explain, expand a little bit more on that? Yes. Yeah, so force free positive reinforcement means using what the dogs love to toys, treats, praise to get them to do what you need them to do. So we don't use any chokers, any shock collars, any prong collars. Actually, uh, in a lot of countries, those are banned. Um, Ireland, I think just banned shock collars. Uh, I could be wrong on that, or it could be prong collars. There is a lot of countries we're kind of behind on that. So when you are looking for a trainer, you want to make sure I don't want your dog to listen to you by using a device. I want your dog to listen to you because he's listening to you. So I try not to use any kind of devices, including a leash to a leash. You're just managing around your dog, right? You're not actually teaching him anything. So I try not to use any, well, I don't use any of those devices. And if a client comes in using them, I, I kind of explain the science behind it. There's a lot of research studies on the psychological damage that those devices do. So we're pretty proud that our company, uh, our company, our employees, everybody that's associated with dynamite and lucky dog, we're all force free trainers. That, that is great. Um, what are the most difficult issues you see with dog training for, for a, a new dog owner or somebody who has a dog? I, I think it's expectations. You might've had a boxer that was so amazing and you get another boxer from the same breeder and he's not so amazing and it's expectations deal with what you, your dog you have, right? So some people want their dogs to be a therapy dog and go to hospitals, but guess what? Your dog doesn't like strangers. So that's not going to happen. So you really have to handle the dog in front of you. They're not, they may not be how the dog was your last dog. So you really just want to make sure that your expert expectations, you're not expecting too much from that dog. And every dog is different, right? Like I said, I got a dog. I was like, oh, he's going to be a therapy dog. He's going to be so great. He was afraid of children. He was afraid of men. And I very quickly had to say that this is not going to be for my dog. My dog is not going to be a therapy dog. People want to take their dogs to Starbucks and the dog is lunging at, you know, at everybody. Yes, there's training, but just have expectations that your dog may never be able to go to Starbucks. I think it's just really dealing with the dog that you have. I think people want certain things from their dog and sometimes their dog is, is just, it's not going to happen. You mentioned therapy dog. What is the difference between a therapy dog and a service dog? Great question, Rich. So therapy dog is for other people, other going to hospitals, going to schools. You are, your dog is providing happiness for other people. Service dog is for whatever disability you have and is task trained. So they can do certain things for you, pick up um, you know, pick up keys, shut off the light, whatever it is that they are for you. And service dogs typically too should not be pet while they're working. All of that things where therapy dog is you can, they love being pet. So it's very different. People also get confused with emotional support. So they used to be able to fly and stuff like that. That's no longer. So you have to be a service dog to be able to do that, which I think is fair and was the right call for, um, I think everybody's dog is an emotional support dog, right? right that's yes. why we have them. Yes. So, but that's a good question. People kind of get confused even when they call, uh, they, they keep saying therapy dog. And then we find out it's actually a service dog they want and you know, vice versa. So, uh, yeah, therapy dog is for other people's pleasure. Service dog is for yourself. Okay. The, uh, one of the, uh, before we, uh, we finish segment, um, what are the top three t tips you can, uh, you should follow uh, with a new puppy? So the new puppy, like I was saying before, with any dog, definitely the crate. Uh, I, I think make sure your dog gets breaks. So I think that's really important. People leave their puppies out all day. They need, they need a nap. They need, I think everybody knows if you're sitting in the living room and your dog's sitting there, you get up to go to the bathroom. What does your dog do? They come and follow you. That's not a good nap, right? So you want them to be in a crate two hours at a time. You can do, um, to make sure that they have that time away. Uh, I would say training, 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 and make sure that your dog is, you find their motivation. So I think that's the biggest thing too, is finding your dog's motivation. People might say, I don't want to train with treats. Well, your dog doesn't really like toys. So that's not going to be uh, motivating. I usually s tell people find your dog's currency and you're going to be very successful in training. So if it's your currency is hot dogs, use the hot dogs. If it's a toy, use the toy, but your dog is going to be motivated by what they want to be motivated by. So once you find that currency, it's going to be really easy to train any dog. 
And that. the other thing is, like I said before, those mental stimulation games. Keep your dog. It's a rainy day. Hide cookies in your house. Do something fun with your dog like that. They love using their nose. Take some milk bones in your yard. Hide them in your yard. People say, oh, my dog digs holes all the time. He's bored. He's bored out there. <laughs> Go hide some cookies out there and he's not going to be bored. And it solves the problem, right? So just make sure you're keeping up not only on the physical stuff, but the mental stimulation. Never heard of the mental stimulation for a dog, but that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important, especially for older dogs. Older dogs get to a point. They don't want to go on a walk. Their hips hurt. They're, you know, they, they don't want to do the walk. So you have to do something with them. So mental stimulation, which is just puzzles, snuffle mats, licking mats, all of that stuff, hiding cookies, fun games like that will get your dog just as tired because they're using their biggest asset, which is their nose. So by using that, they get exhausted. That's why um, bomb dogs, detection dogs, they can't do 5,000 searches in a row. It's exhausting for them. So you want to make sure you're incorporating that daily into your into your dog's training day. Well, I'm learning a great deal today. Okay. For sure. You said so. I'll talk dog. Well, I'll be here forever. Right? Yes. <laughs> the, uh, one, well, I want to make sure that the uh, listeners have an opportunity to look you up. So how can people find you? So they can go to the website, dynamitedogtraining.com or luckydogtrainingclub.com. But also um, all over social media, a lot of people message me there on Instagram or TikTok. So it's at Dynamite Dog Training, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, the email, you can always do sales at dynamitedogtraining.com if you want to email. But I check, we check all the messages everywhere. So we we will get to you. And on the website too, there's a contact form that, that you can put there. And again, if you need help, virtually is a great non-expensive way, you know, that you can get training for your dog. So again, if we can see you, we can coach you. So even little things like this for the puppy, like you said, you didn't know, they make a huge difference in somebody's yeah. puppy yes. upbringing, right? Yes. It's a tough year when you get a puppy. So having a professional guide you is so helpful. That is awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, the, uh, in our show notes, we're also going to have the, uh, Jamie's contact information as well. Awesome. So they'll be able to, they're going to sell notes. They can be able to link directly to your website awesome. and also to your social media. Jamie, thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, certainly I'm very proud to be your business lawyer. It's been awesome to work with you. Thank you. I and you're amazing. Appreciate. Hire Rich if you need a lawyer, cause he, he is amazing. He's been by my side for years. So whenever I have an issue, I, uh, I call him and the advice is always spot on and uh, I'm very fortunate. So thank, thank you. Thank you. It means, it means a great deal. So I'd like to close the show as I always do. Uh, thank you for listening today. If you want to have more information about Jamie's dynamite dog training center.com. Did I get the dynamite dog training.com dynamite dog training.com. Uh, my website is Florida small business legal center.com until next week. This is rich Sierra. Remember that my goal is to help you succeed. <laughs>